Daniel chapter 2. So, um, it's a big week. This was, this was, this was a cool week. Uh, first day of fall was this last week. So that's exciting. You get to, uh, get to enjoy some cooler weather. I, I love the beginning of every season. Uh, just the, the change, the newness, that's awesome. And the Browns won, just to get that in there. How can you not root for the Browns, especially since the Steelers haven't won a game yet? Okay, so Daniel <laughs> chapter 2. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm from northeastern Ohio, so I took a vow to always root for the Browns. Um, it's not true. So <laughs> Daniel chapter 2. Uh, if, if you were here last week, uh, you remember, and if you weren't here last week, you can always catch up on our teachings on our website um, or on our YouTube channel. You can go back and follow along. But so Daniel chapter 2 is the story of the, this handful of, of Hebrew boys, these Israelite young men who were forcefully taken from their homeland in Jerusalem, <clears throat> and they were taken to Babylon, this foreign culture. And they're, they're just immersed in the culture of Babylon. They have been forced to learn the language of Babylon, this foreign language. They've been forced to dress like Babylonians. They've been forced into the education system of Babylon. Uh, the, these young guys were the best and the brightest. And so they were, they were given government jobs, right? I mean, they were, they were put in service of the king. And it so created all these dilemmas for them of like, wait a second, this is not our culture, this is not our king, this is not where we want to be. But all of those things, the, the, the language, the education, serving the king, it, none of that they, they didn't view as compromise. They were okay with that. They went along with that. But if you remember from last week, what was the thing that they said, no, we will not do that? Do you remember? It was a food, right? We will not eat the king's food. Because if you remember from last week, food was a symbol of their identity, as people of God. It was a symbol of their allegiance. And to eat food that was sacrificed to idols, that was set before the king and sacrificed to the king, was to say, I will, I will pledge my allegiance to this kingdom of Babylon. And they were not willing to do that. And so here they are. It creates this, this tension for them, right? Um, they're, they're, they're in this culture, this Babylonian culture that is counter to the ways of God, and so they have to make decisions all along the way to say, what am I going to go along with and what am I going to resist? Does this sound like your story? I mean, I've talked to some of you over this last week to say, man, this is me. Okay, I, I realize like I'm in this current of our culture, right? Our, our culture, it, it's like there's a current, like you step in a river, right? And, and the river is moving you a direction, and we're in the current, and there are some things that are fine and okay, and we're just going to go along with it, but there are some things that we are going to swim against. And the reason we swim against them is because we follow Jesus, and Jesus leads us in a different way. So this is, this is following Jesus is swimming against the stream. And, and we feel it, don't we? I, if we don't, it probably means we've, we're just sort of all floating along okay. Right? We're just sort of, whoo, you know, a bit of a joy ride. But following Jesus is hard. Because there, there are some things that Jesus calls us to that are they're, they're unpopular. And, and they're, not, they're not popular opinion. And so for us, um, if we're going to keep swimming against the stream, if, if we're going to give our allegiance to the kingdom of God and to the King Jesus, then we're going to need a couple of things. We're going to need energy. I mean, we're going to need regular sort of routines where we come back and we're reminded that it's all worth it, right? Because, because God is leading us in this. Because we're going to get tired and we're going to just want to float. We're going to need to be reminded that we're not alone. Like, it, it, I, man, I'm just, it's just me and I'm just swimming and I'm doing everything I can uh, against this. And it's just me by myself. Like, when we're, when we're exhausted, we can start to feel like it's just me against the world. And so we come on Sunday mornings and we realize we're singing these songs with all these other people. I believe in Jesus, Right? That you're not alone. You're not alone. And so we need this if we're going to keep swimming against the stream. So this is the story of Daniel, so relevant for us. So we're just going to walk through the whole story. It's, it's really long, um, and we'll make some observations as we go, and hopefully we'll land at a place that's really helpful. Daniel chapter 2. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. 
So this is what Babylon was really known for, these sort of mystical arts, big into astrology and, um, <clears throat> you know, all sorts of these like secret incantations and stuff like that. That's what Babylon was known for. Um, they've done some, archae- if you're into this thing, they've done like archaeological discoveries where they've discovered these, these massive books of like dream interpretations and stuff like that from ancient Babylon. So this is, this was their, the council of the king, these magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers. So um, they, when, he, when they came in before, and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Long live the king. This is what you're supposed to say, right, to royalty. Long live the king. Tell your servants the dream, and we will make something up. Uh, That's not what they say. They say, tell your servants a dream and we will interpret it. Now the king replied, listen to this, to the astrologers. This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your house turned into piles of rubble. But on the bright side, right? If you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. We got a problem, right? I mean, you start to pity the fools, right? Who are like in this role of, of uh, you know, the wise people surrounding the king. I'm not going to tell you the dream because you're just going to go back to your books and you're going to look through your stock interpretations and you're going to give those to me. I want to make sure you actually know what you're talking about. So you tell me what I dreamed while I was asleep in my own bed. You tell me the dream, and then you interpret it for me, and then I'll know you have the answer. This is a problem. So they realize it's a problem. Um, so once more, they replied, verse 7, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and then we will interpret it. But the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream and I will know you can interpret it for me. What? I mean, what do you do? What do you do if you're one of these guys? I mean, you've been like doing the song and dance this whole time, right? Like you got the little incantations and you got your books and you got your astrology and you're reading the signs and you know it's all sort of hogwash, right? But you, you kind of give them the, you, you give them the interpretations and you, you kind of put on a nice show and, but deep down you realize you don't have the answers. And here's this king this sort of troubled tyrant who has this dream that disturbs him, and he gives you the ultimatum. He says, no, you tell me what I dreamed or you're dead. You're dead. This is what troubled tyrants do, isn't it, right? What do they do? Off with their heads, right? You've heard this story before. Off with their heads. Uh, How many of you have had tyrants in your life? Like people who ran the household like a tyrant? Have you ever, did you grow up in a family where like there was a tyrant leading the household? Like, you do that or else. Um, I had to learn pretty quickly. Like, you know, you get emotionally spent. Parenting is exhausting. And um, sometimes you hear these decrees coming out of your mouth that you think, I probably shouldn't have just said that, right? Because then I'm going to have to follow through on it. Have you ever done that? Like, if you do that one more time, you will not be able to watch TV for a year. Like, you, you just say these things and then you realize, I shouldn't have said that because now I'm going to have to follow through on it, or I'm going to have to, like, take my word back. This is what, like, people who are tyrants, this is what they do. I remember having a soccer coach. Maybe you had co- coaches who were tyrants, right? And they would just, like, get really angry. They'd make decrees. I had a soccer coach once. Maybe some of you, are, you know, are, are in situations like that now. I don't know. Uh, I had a soccer coach once who w- we were winning the game, but we weren't winning by enough. We were playing really poorly. And he said, if you don't win by three goals, you will run until the sun goes down. It was, like, three hours. It was, like, I mean, he's just angry. Thankfully, we didn't have to do all of that. Um, But this happens. He's a troubled tyrant, this king, and he makes this decree. So what do you do if you're one of these wise men, right? Like, you just start making something up. You just take a stab at it. Like, I see a pink monkey on a unicorn, you know, like flying across the sun. Like, what do you do? But they know they're had, right? They know, like, they do not have an answer. And so here's what they say, verse 10. Now, the astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. 
No king, however great or mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks, it is too difficult. And listen to this. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they do not live among humans. I mean, do you hear just a simple admission? We, we, don't, we don't have it. It ain't me. That our, our, our wisdom, our knowledge, our, our resources, it, they are completely dried up. That the only one, and they recognize, and here's the interesting thing, they recognize this answer you're looking for, it can only be revealed. And they, they were polytheists, right? They believed in many gods. But, so they, they say the gods. But that what they're saying is this answer, this thing you're asking of king, it can only be revealed by, by the divine. And we don't have a connection to the divine. None of the gig is up. God, God doesn't live among human beings. He doesn't dwell among us. Now, this is, this is so awesome. If you're, if you're a Jew, right, living... 200 years before Christ, when the book of Daniel sort of came into being. And you read this, and you hear these guys, like, sort of stammering around saying, wait a second, this is too hard, nobody has ever asked this. The only one who can reveal this is the gods, and they don't live among human beings. If you're, if you're a Jew, you say, uh, hold, hold on, there is a God who lives among human beings, there is a God, the God, the creator of heaven and earth, who has made his dwelling among human beings. Let me tell you a story about this God who wants to be known by people, right? I mean, this is the story of the Old Testament. You remember like in the, in the Exodus when God's people were, they were in slavery in Egypt and God says, I just want you to be with me. And he tells Pharaoh, the troubled tyrant at the time, he says, you let my people go and they're going to come to me and they're going to worship me. They're going to be with me in the desert. And God's people, he rescues them, he brings them out uh, into the wilderness to himself in this kind of intimate relationship. And here's what God says in Exodus 25, verse 8. He says, then, like, so they're there in the desert, they're figuring this whole new life out with God, and he says, then, have them make a sanctuary, a dwelling place for me, and I will dwell among them. I mean, do you see that, like, the whole Old Testament is the story of a God who wants to dwell among his people, a God who wants to live among human beings. This is what God does. He says, build this tent, and you'll build this tent, and it'll be right in the middle of the community, and I will be in the tent. I will make my home there, and you can come in, and you can know me, and you can have your sins forgiven, and you can live with me. I will be your God. You will be my people. This is the story of the Old Testament. So if you're a Jew, and you're reading this, and you say, like, yes, okay, you realize, you think that the gods don't live among human beings, but let me introduce you to a God who does live among human beings, who's always wanted to live among human beings. And, and, and he is this God who's revealed through the Old Testament. Do you, do you see? Are you with me? Are you with me? All right. So this, is, <clears throat> this, this, this door that is slammed in the face of these astrologers, it is an open door for Daniel and his friends who know the true and living God to walk through. It's a, it's a beautiful story. So they go on. Um, verse 12, it says, So this made the king so angry and furious, and then he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. Now, stop there for a second. Who, what did Daniel and his three friends do? What was their job? They were wise men in Babylon. Remember, they were pulled in. They go through a three-year master program to be wise men in Babylon. This is their heads on the line. Their heads are going to roll. This is a huge problem. So the decree was issued in the, to put the wise men to death, and the men were sent out to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Now, when uh, Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put, them, to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. When the executioner is coming your direction to your address, you speak to them with wisdom and tact as much as you can. These are just practical life hints from the Bible, right? Um, then the king, then he asked the king's officer, well, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? And Arioch explained the matter to him. Well, he was not getting a whole lot of sleep and he was troubled, right? There's a problem. At, at this, Daniel went in to see the king and he asked him for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. So what does Daniel ask for? Time. What was the king not willing to give anybody else? Time. And then what does Daniel commit himself to? If you give me time, I will interpret the dream for you. 
Do you realize the faith step that Daniel's taking here? Like, this is huge. He doesn't have the interpretation. He doesn't know it. He's depending on God to give it to him. But he says, give me time, and we will give you the interpretation. Then Daniel, he returned to his house, and he explained the matter to his friends. Would you love to hear that conversation? Like, right? And he explained the matter to his friends, and he urged them, plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he... Uh, and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Notice that Daniel wasn't alone. Like Daniel's doing this thing and he wasn't alone. He had a missional community around him. He had these people who he leaned on to say like, we we need to pray together. Like we we are up against a wall um, and we need to pray. And so they prayed together. Verse 19, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision And Daniel prays the God of heaven. So Daniel just launches into this beautiful song, right? Verse 20. And this is Daniel's song. He says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. What does Daniel say belong to God? What two things? Wisdom and power. What is Babylon known for? Wisdom from all these, you know, astrologers and whatever. Wisdom. And who's on the throne and who has all the power? The king. This is what Daniel, this is what Babylon is known for, wisdom and power, but their wisdom has run dry, and the king himself, and their king himself doesn't have the power to interpret the dream. This is what Daniel says. He praises God because he says, God, you are the one with wisdom and power. You are the one who changes times and seasons. You, dis, you depose kings and you raise up others. You are the one, God, who is the unseen mover behind all of human history, these massive movements. This is what Daniel praises God for. And then he, he goes back to the king. He, he tells the executioner, he goes to him and he says, okay, take me to see the king because we've got the interpretation. So he, he comes and they take him back into the king's presence. Verse 31, this is what Daniel says to the king. Now your majesty looked and there before you was a pink monkey. Un- no, that's not right. Uh, there Looked and there before you stood a large statue Go ahead, if you have your Bibles, you can underline the word statue. We'll come back to that. An enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, and its chest and arms were like silver, and its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet were partly iron and partly baked clay. The word baked clay is like terracotta, so it's like terracotta feet, so you picture that. Now, what you were watching... In your dream, this rock was cut out, but it wasn't cut out by human hands. And this rock came and struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay, and it smashed them. And then the whole thing, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, were broken to pieces, and they became like dust in the wind, like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. And the wind swept the whole thing away so that not a trace was left. But this rock that had struck the statue became a huge mountain, and it filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now, again, the word statue here, we just sort of read over it. It's like, oh, he had a dream about a statue. That's, that's cool. But Daniel, he goes on, and he says, here's what the statue represents. It, it represents these kingdoms, these, these powerful empires. And he looks at Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, but you are the head of gold on this statue. Which, if you're Nebuchadnezzar, that's got to feel pretty good, right? That's what I always thought. I'm the head of gold. Um, and then, but there's this change of materials, right? Nebuchadnezzar's reign isn't going to last forever. Babylon's reign isn't going to last forever. There's going to be another kingdom that rises up, and then another kingdom after them, and another kingdom after them. This statue pictures these kingdoms that will come following the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the word statue is an interesting word. It's the word salem. Everybody want to say salem? Salem. That's how you, it's T-S-E-L-E-M, salem. But in other places in the Old Testament, it's translated as image. Image. He has a dream about an image. Now, good Bible students, where's the first place you read about the word image in the Bible? What page are we looking on? Page one. Page one. The opening page of the Bible. This should be like ding, 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 right? Dashboard lights are going off. Like there's something here we need to pay attention to. In Genesis 1, we have the word salem. Here, here it is in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind or human beings in our salem, our image, 
in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over the livestock and the wild animals that move along the ground uh, and, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male, female, he created them. Next verse. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. <clears throat> so the opening pages of Scripture say, There is a salem, there is an image of God, and they're human beings. Now, do you realize, like, in the Old Testament, there was a huge prohibition against making images of God, making statues and carvings of God. And there were a couple of reasons for it. One was because any, like, statue that a human being could create is going to fall far short of who God is actually like. You know, like, it just is, is going to be infinitely smaller than what God actually is. Does that make sense? But do you know the other reason why God says, don't ever make images of me? Because God already has. And the world is full of them. And this room is full of them. You are made in the image of God. You are different from all of creation. You are different from all animals, from birds, from fish, from, from animals. You are created in God's image, God's salem. And, and notice what it means to be created in the image of God. The first thing is what? Fill the earth. Fill the earth. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful things about being created in the image of God, is that you have this ability to, for, for man, for woman, humankind, to come together to make a covenant relationship, to, to commit their lives to each other, to come together in covenant, and out of that covenant relationship to what? To form new life. To, like, to, to, to actually create new life, that the world can go on. I say, like, this is not the great commandment, but it's the first commandment, and it's my favorite commandment. Um, and you can come to the help I'm a parent, conference if you want to know more about what we're talking about here, this creating new life. Um, so that's the first thing, being created in the image of God says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with new life, create new life, this is awesome. And what's the second thing you notice about being created in the image of God? What are we called to do? To rule! How awesome is that? I used to have a mentor who said, you give people an inch, they'll think they're a ruler, right? I was like, man, this is lame. I didn't say it. He said it. I'm just passing it along. Uh, you can turn to your neighbor and say, you rule, right? Uh, don't do that. That's kind of lame too. So, <clears throat> but this is part of to rule. And what are you supposed to rule over as somebody made in the image of God? As God's images. Fish and water and birds and sky and creatures and land. What does that mean? You're supposed to rule over it all. It means you're supposed to take care of it to love it, to steward it, to, to exercise your authority, our authority as human beings over all of creation in beautiful and loving and caring ways. What are we not supposed to rule over? Each other. Each other. And what does this statue represent? What does this statue represent? Powerful people ruling over others. You know, troubled tyrants giving decrees, your life will be ended. Your life will be ended. Those are our enemies. So Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the dream interpretation that Daniel gives is to, is to say this whole thing, this whole thing, this whole way of running the world where powerful people think they have ruling authority over other people, it's all going to come crashing down that there is this rock that comes from God. And this rock comes and it strikes the statue right at its foundation, its terracotta feet. And the whole statue, all these empires, all these powers, they come crashing to the ground and it says they're just like, they're, there's like dust in the wind. And there's not a trace left of them. Right, there's not a trace left of them. But this rock that struck the statue and destroyed it, what happens to it? It says this rock, it actually turns into this mountain. It grows into this mountain that fills the whole earth. And here's what Daniel says about this. It says, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor, it will, be, nor will it be left to other people. It will crush all of those kingdoms and it will bring them to an end and it itself will endure forever. 
But the meaning of this vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, not by human hands, this rock that broke the iron and the bronze and the clay and the silver and the gold to pieces, this is it. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. This dream is trustworthy and true. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and, and paid honor to him and offered the incense presented to him. And the king said to Daniel, listen to what King Nebuchadnezzar says, surely your God, the God of gods, and he is the God of gods and he is the Lord of kings, the revealer of mysteries, and you were able to reveal this mystery. Do you hear what the King Nebuchadnezzar says? The one on top of the statue, the head of gold, he says, your God is the, the God of gods, the King of kings. This is unbelievable, this story. Now, in the first century, uh, there were these, <clears throat> these, these, uh, these Jewish freedom fighters, they were called zealots, and they would arm themselves with like whew, swords, you know, under their cloaks and stuff, and then they would jump out on Roman soldiers, because Rome was kind of the power of the day, right? And they would try to kill them. And do you know what their inspiration was for trying to kill these Roman soldiers? They had one chapter in the Bible that they turned to more than any other. Any guesses what that chapter of the Bible was? It's a low-hanging fruit, people. Daniel chapter 2. You know why? Let's crush them. Let's bring the kingdom of God. Let's crush them. Jesus comes marching into Jerusalem, not marching so much as riding on a donkey. And they think, ah, oh, let's crush him. This is the rock from heaven. It's going to come. It's going to destroy him. And this is what Jesus says in John 16. He looks at his disciples. He says, take heart. Be of good courage. I have overcome the world. I have have conquered the world, Jesus says. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. He starts his ministry. He says, the kingdom of God is coming. It is here. It is breaking into earth here. And now God's dwelling place is among his people. God has come to save us. And then Jesus, he says, I've overcome the world. I've conquered the world. And then what happens to Jesus? He's arrested. And he's put on trial. And he's beaten. And he's mocked. And his purple robe is put on him to mock him. Oh, he's a king. And he's a crown put on his head. But it's a crown of thorns. And he's spit on. And he's abused. And he's hung on a Roman cross. And he has a sign above his head that says what? King! King of the Jews. And it's all meant to be a spectacle. It's all meant to be a mockery. And Jesus dies. He gives his life. And three days later, he's raised from the dead. He's resurrected from the dead. And he comes back and he looks at the people who had done this. He looks at his disciples and he says, peace be with you. And then he commissions them. He says, the kingdom of God is here. Go into all the world and make disciples of me, the king of kings, and build the kingdom. This is what Jesus does. How crazy is that, that the rock that smashes the king, the, the whole kingdom of the world, this whole thing, the rock that smashes it, the way the rock smashes it is by being smashed himself. He doesn't smash it with violence. He doesn't ride into Jerusalem on a war horse with sword blazing, leading a military fight. They would have joined him in it. But the way the kingdom of God comes into this world is by being crushed, by choosing to give up his life rather than to take life. And this is what, this is what a second um, um, Colossians 2.15 says, that Jesus, having disarmed the powers and the authorities, you hear that? That having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. We sang the song earlier that says, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. The lamb will reign forever. And who's the lamb? What happened to the lamb? The lamb was slain. The lamb gave up his life. Like this, is, this is the unbelievable power of the gospel. This is the, the good news of Jesus, that this is the way the kingdom of God comes into the world. It looks like self-sacrificial love, and it smashes, it crushes the very foundation of the kingdoms of this world, but it always looks like self-sacrificial love. So a couple of things as we end this, this unbelievable story. So, such a powerful story. One is maybe you yourself, you would place yourself in the place of those astrologers, those enchanters, those you know, sort of diviners. It's like, if you're really honest, you'd say, man, I know the songs. I can sing the songs. I know, I know stories in the Bible. I know all of that. But when it really comes down to it, you would say, you know what? God does not live among me. I don't, I don't know God. 
Um, this, this God does not live among human beings. And, and the, the beautiful news is that even now, he, here and now today, God is not far from you. God is with you. God loves you. God is pursuing you. And the, the amazing news of the gospel is that the moment you open your life up to Jesus, that you surrender to Jesus as king, he actually comes and makes his dwelling within you. That the presence of God, this God who's a revealer of mysteries, this God who's a creator of heaven and earth, actually wants to live within you, to know you, to relate to you. This is, this is the most amazing news in the world. And it all comes just by surrendering your life to Jesus, just by opening your life up to Jesus. You may know people around you, secularism in our culture, right? The, the current of this culture. It may say, like, we have answers. We know, we know how the world works, and we have all of the answers, and it's all kind of in this framework right here. And if they're really honest, they'll say, you know what? Our answers only go so far. We don't. Th- those answers, are, they only come from God, and we don't know God. And so you're going to have opportunities as you know and as you relate to God and as you relate to other people to show people the goodness that there is a God who loves them and wants to make his home in them. It's part of our role in this world. Number two, one of the biggest mistakes people, Christians can make is to put our trust and our allegiance in any kingdom, in any nation, in any government, in any power structure that at some point will crumble and be washed away like dust. I mean, this is, this is one of the big temptations. It's one of the big temptations to say, I'm going to put my trust in this kingdom, in this nation, in this government, and I'm going to, I'm going to give my heart and my allegiance to this government. And if we're really honest, what's going to happen at some point, this, this whole thing is going to, it's going to crumble. But But our hope is not in any of these nations, in any of these power structures. Our hope is in the kingdom of God, this kingdom that will last forever, that cannot be shaken by troubled tyrants, this kingdom that endures, that, is, that, that submits to Jesus and to the way of Jesus. So we put our trust in him, in him alone. And third, we just keep swimming. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Right? You know this, right? Like it's hard. Following Jesus is hard. It's not easy. we come to you like Daniel and his friends and we just humbly admit God that we don't have the answers in ourselves but God because of your grace you've come to us you, you've made your home your dwelling among us and Jesus like the, the amazing mystery most amazing mystery of all is that God you want to make your dwelling inside of us and you have so God, we, this, this moment, this day, we renew our trust in you, our allegiance to you. We ask that you would take any fear of the future, of the unknown. God, we pray that you would reveal any places where our allegiance has gotten wrapped up in things that do not look like your kingdom. Jesus, we ask that you would heal broken things inside of us, God, that you would, God, show us what it means God, to know you, to relate to you, to hear your voice. God, we trust you. We trust that you are with us and you will lead us. Jesus, we praise your name because you are the king of kings and your kingdom, God, will have no end.